Okay, let me move this. So this is a timeline that uh, was put together by Dr. Uh, Asa Hilliard, one of my teachers. And he starts with Dynasty One, but what we're going to do is uh, start in the pre-dynastic era. And the earliest of the civilizations that we know about is Nabda Playa, which was actually fairly recently discovered. And this dates back to uh, 7,500 BCE. It's located in the Nubian Desert, and the um, human remains suggest a uh, sub-Saharan African origin. It's the world's oldest astronomical site. I'm not going to say more about that, but um, there are some references that will uh, can, that there have been whole books written on Nabda Playa, uh, the Badarian culture, Nakata One, Nakata Two, um, and Nakata Two. Uh, includes a place called Tasseti. Uh, back in the 1990s, uh, an Egyptologist from the University of Chicago by the name of Bruce Williams published an article called The Lost Pharaohs of Nubia, which set everything on his, on his head. Because what he did was he actually uh, admitted and, and documented that the earliest uh pharaohs were indeed african um i'm gonna skip over that so uh after uh the pre-dynastic era the first two dynasties are called the archaic age and this was the union of kemet you had upper kemet or uh southern kemet and you had uh lower kemet or northern kemet and uh, these places uh, operated fairly independently until they were uh, combined. And the capital was set up at Menefer. Uh, not a lot is known about most of these kings, but we know this man. He was the very first pharaoh that we know of. And uh, we suspect that he was the son of Scorpion, who was the leader from Upper uh, upper Egypt, uh, Upper Kemet, who actually united the two lands. And he was the very first to wear the double crown. He was somewhat of uh, an engineer because he diverted the Nile and created the Delta. And he built uh, Menefer or Memphis on land that had been drained. Memphis is still there, but is uh, basically not a city anymore. It's a, a, a large museum. It was the first known uh, capital city built about 3,200 uh, before the Christian era, uh, before the common era, originally eight miles long, four miles wide, and was the seat of uh, administrative and religious power. Interestingly enough, uh, the capital uh, was called the Double White House, um, the, the King's House. I'm standing next to one of the smallest statues in front of the museum. They are humongous. Uh, this, uh, then we went from the first two dynasties to the, the first, what Dr. Uh, Hilliard called the first golden age or the old kingdom um, or pyramid age is, uh, as the Egyptologists called it. And this included dynasties three to six. Now, let me say that a dynasty, theoretically, is a family that is uh, in rulership uh, so that there is no set uh, length of time that a dynasty exists. Uh, it can be anywhere between a few years to hundreds of years, as we'll see. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, some of the dynasties were related to previous dynasties, um, which I'm still trying to, to, to figure out. Most of the pyramids that are still in existence in, in Egypt today were built during this period of time. And a lot of the writings that we have that are called the pyramid texts were in the tomb. Uh, this is a... These are photographs of, of, of uh, pharaoh, statues of pharaohs of the third dynasty. 
And Pharaoh Joseph is uh, significant because, uh, to me because of his, um, his uh, scribe, uh, architect, philosophy, for, and Imhotep. I think a lot of people may have heard of Imhotep. Uh, and he is recognized as, as being the very first physic, world's first known physician. Now, uh, I emphasize the word known because I am convinced that the world's first physician had to be a woman. Um, and I can uh, take questions after we finish uh, for anyone who may want to know why. Uh, but he was uh, recognized as the fir world's first multi-genius <clears throat> He was an astronomer, scribe, a sage, priest, poet. He actually is um, given credit for originally saying, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Uh, he is an architect. He designed and built the world's first pyramid, uh, which is the step pyramid that we'll look at in a few minutes. Uh, again, he was the original upon which Asclepius, the Greek god of healing, was based, and the Hippocratic Oath was an oath to Asclepius, which was actually this black man here. Some of the early Christians during the, uh, the early era of Christianity um, worship him as one with Christ. That's when you had uh, in the first few hundred years where they had Christ cults until Constantine organized everything. Um, this is the pyramid that um, Imhotep designed and had built. It's called the Step Pyramid, and it's at a place called Saqqara, built around 2600 BCE. I don't know whether you can see my uh, little arrow, but you see this little spot uh, in the bottom right corner, um, and uh, I am standing there to give an idea of just how huge this thing is. Um, again, uh, the, the very corner down here, and I'm standing there. Uh, um, because there was no separation of sacred and secular in, uh, in Kemet, there was always a temple associated with the, uh, th these um, buildings. So this is the temple that is next to the step pyramid. Um, uh, this is uh, Sneferu, the first pharaoh of the fourth dynasty. And uh, he built two pyramids, uh, one called the Bent Pyramid. His son is Khufu of the fourth dynasty who built what we call the Great Pyramid. Um, the Greeks call him Cheops. I think it's, it, it, it's, it's interesting to note that one of the things that invaders have done is that they, when they conquer or when they come in, they rename things uh, so that his mama called him Khufu. So I think that's what we'll call him. But at the same time, uh, I think that it's interesting because those of you who may have seen the original roots may remember the poignant scene where uh, Kunta Kente is whipped mercilessly in order to force him to accept the name Toby. Um, so um, uh, we'll call him Khufu. Uh, nah. These are the plains of Giza where those three great pyramids are located. Um, and there's me at the plains of Giza. Uh, I think is a uh, very interesting. The Great Pyramid, I think is a very interesting thing. It was built with 2.3 million stones weighing an average of two and a half tons each, some as heavy as 70 tons. It was 48 stories high, took about 60 years to build. And contrary to uh, some opinion, it was not built by Hebrews, uh, Hebrews. It was not built by slave labor but it was built by professional builders. Um, they have actually uncovered, archeologists have uncovered uh, the, the villages of the people who built 
Uh, and these were frequently professional builders. Uh, this is a tunnel that leads to the burial chamber. And uh, when I went, you could walk up to the top. Now, uh, <laughs> that was quite a feat. I was much, much younger. Uh, and uh, you're walking up 48 floors, uh, 48 stories. And um, in some of the areas you had to bend over even in, I'm, I'm, I'm only five, six and I had to bend over uh, for at least maybe five to eight uh, stories. So it was quite a feat to be able to get there. And this is the Mastaba at the top of the Great Pyramid. Uh, behind each of the three pyramids, there are uh, smaller pyramids that are said to be dedicated to three women that are important, were important to Khufu. Um, and uh, the, two of them are said to be his wives and one of them is said to be from his mother. There's also a museum next to the Great Pyramid that has this ship, the solar bark. Um, I don't have time to get into it, but if we understand the philosophy and the cosmology of the uh, uh, belief system of the ancient Kemetic people, um, they uh, believe that a solar bark could take them uh, to paradise. And this was buried in Khufu's tomb. Um, the, Khufu's son, Khafre, built the second largest pyramid at Giza. Uh, his name was Khafre. And uh, his grandson, Menkara, built the smaller one of the three at Giza. Uh, when we were there, there was a, a little old Egyptian man who claimed that he was an anthropologist and that he had participated in a lot of digs. And he said, if, if we, uh, these are uh, two friends of mine here. And he said that if we would give him $5 each, he would show us some things that would make us very happy. So being tr the trusting people we were, we went to him behind some uh, catacombs and, and uh, he showed us this underground uh, area that had, uh, was so old, if you look behind behind me, you can see the outline of figures that are so old that the feet, feet, their facial feet, the facial features have been worn off. So um, yeah, this this was quite a tip. It was well worth the five dollars. I think we each ended up giving him uh, ten dollars each, which was apparently a lot of money. Another fourth dynasty pharaoh. And again, if you remember, I, I mentioned that one of the ways that uh, Sheikh Anta Jok uh, said that we could tell that the ancient Egyptians were black was because of the figures that they left of themselves so that um, we're gonna be seeing a lot of those things. Uh, this is another fourth dynasty pharaoh. Um, uh, fifth dynasty is uh, personality is Patahotep. Uh, he was the grand uncle and, and tutor of Pharaoh Asa of the fifth dynasty, wrote the oldest book in existence, which was about 2,500 uh, before the Christian era. Uh, as the story goes, he was in line to uh, become Pharaoh and renounce the throne in order to become a priest. And the book he wrote, The Teachings of Patahotep, which was translated by Dr. Asa Hilliard and others, is a classic. It's a little book that's so filled with, with, with knowledge and, and wisdom that um, uh, uh, years ago, I had a teenage study group. And even though that book is maybe 70, 80 pages long, it took us a year to go through it. And you'll see his hair, which is another cultural feature. Um, that is a book that I, I highly recommend for everyone. It's called The Teachings of Patahotep, the oldest book in the world. 
by Asa Hilliard, Larry Williams, and Nia Damali. Uh, in fact, Nia Damali is, uh, is still living. Uh, Baba Asa and um, Baba uh, Larry Obadeli are ancestors now, but Nia Damali is, is the owner of a bookstore in Atlanta. Um, this is Patahotep's tomb. And it's located in Saqqara near the uh, Step Pyramid. Sixth Dynasty Pharaoh, this is Pepe. Um, he was the second Pharaoh of the Six Dynasties and he consolidated power by invading deep into Asiatic countries. And he reigned for 49 years. Uh, this is uh, Mayera, a Sixth Dynasty um, person. After the first golden age, uh, civil war broke out and they call that the first intermediate period, um, a time of political unrest and civil war it lasted about 120 years. And it comprises dynasty seven to 10 and part of uh, dynasty 11. At that time, uh, to be convicted of being a politician was grounds for the death penalty because uh, by necessity, they saw that politicians frequently had to sacrifice what they knew to be right and correct. And they saw that as a capital offense to um, compromise truth and justice and righteousness. The second golden age corresponds to what Egyptologists call the Middle Kingdom or the Literary Age. And it includes dynasties 11 and 12 it lasted approximately 260 years. And one of the preeminent pharaohs of that was Amenemet of the 12th dynasty who reigned for 47 years, performed a major reorganization of the administrative system. He constructed what's called the Black Pyramid at Dashur and um, did a lot of things to advance um, uh, Kemet. And if you, as you can see his hair, he had what we now call dreadlocks. Uh, I took these pictures myself. Uh, you can see that um, these are just some uh, Middle Kingdom heads. I don't think that they are uh, royalty or anything. These are just how some of the people looked. Then after the, uh, the second golden age, you, there occurred what was known as the second intermediate period. And it occurred after the 12th dynasty fell when a group of people only identified as the Hyksos invaded Kemet. To this day, we're not sure who the Hyksos were. Uh, apparently the word Hyksos translates into shepherd kings. This lasted about 160 years, but during that time they left nothing of worth to mark their presence. They did not contribute anything uh, to Kemet. The third golden age corresponds to what Egyptologists call the New Kingdom or the Imperial Age and included dynasties 18 and 19. It lasted about 350 years uh, from about 1554 to 1190. And uh, they drove out the um, the Hyksos. And the 17th dynasty were the parents of the 18th dynasty. Uh, the pertinent pharaohs and their wives were Amos, uh, whose wife Tetesheri uh, was a uh, very, very important. Uh, second Enre Tao, Ahotep I, Kamos Ahotep II. Um, Amos Nefertari of the, uh, is called the mother of the 18th dynasty. And she was the daughter of Second Enri Tao and Ahotep I. And she was the royal sister and wife to Amos, the mother of Amenhotep I. After her death, she was deified, uh, made a goddess. And this was Amenhotep, her son, Amenhotep I, who was the second pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. Um, Another important pharaoh of the 18th dynasty was Hatshepsut. She was a female pharaoh. And interestingly enough, she was not the very first female. There were other female pharaohs, 
so that, um, you know, we like to say queen this and queen that, but she was a, actually a pharaoh. Uh, she started out as co-regent with her stepson, Tutmosis III. Uh, she was the daughter of a pharaoh and the sister of a pharaoh and the mother, stepmother of a pharaoh. But during her reign, uh, Kemet was not at war. They established a lot of trade routes uh, that had been lost during the uh, Hyksos. And she actually rebuilt the wealth of uh, Kemet. And her reign is called the Restoration uh, Reign. Her mortuary temple was uh, literally built into the side of a mountain. And uh, if you look at it, it looks like some of the buildings you see in Egypt that came uh, thousands of years later. Uh, Tutmosis, and we'll see that later. Tutmosis III, her stepson, was the sixth pharaoh, and he ruled for about 54 years. He was the, uh, the first 22 as co-regent, uh, and he was a brilliant military strategist. He never lost a battle. And he turned Kemet into the world's superpower of that time. And he ruled and conquered from northern Syria to the fourth cataract of the Hapi or the Nile River in Nubia. This woman was uh, awesome, uh, Queen T. She was the great royal wife of Amenhotep III. Um, and she was the mother of Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV, and the grandmother of someone who I'm sure you all would know, uh, King Tut, uh, Tutankhamun. Um, her son, Amenhotep IV, or Akhenaten, is called the heretic king. He married someone uh, whom you may have heard of called Nefertiti. Uh, he challenged the religious traditions by abandoning worship of Amun and introducing Aten. Um, he's given credit for introducing monotheism to the world by uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, who said that he profoundly influenced the biblical Moses. Um, some of the things that uh, he has written uh, bear a remarkable resemblance to Psalm, the 104th Psalm in the Bible. Um, I recommend uh, for anyone interested in going further, the, the first book to read, I think, is uh, Nine Valid Contributions to Civilization by Anthony Browder. Um, uh, uh, Anthony Browder go, uh, sticks his toe in a lot of this information. Um, and there was a lot of a lot of Egyptologists, and even in the medical literature, there's a lot of uh, people that say that Akhenaten, you know, even though they know he wasn't black, uh, because he had a uh, wide nose and lips uh, that were prominent, that he must have had some type of illness. And believe it or not, there are um, whole chapters written to, uh, to this. Now, this is the figure that we normally associate with uh, Nefertiti. And um, in my research, she's believed to be a daughter of I, uh, who was um, Queen T's brother. Uh, this bust, the history of this bust is that it was found in the ruins of Amarna, which is Akhenaten's um, city. And the Germans who saw it saw the royal headdress and they automatically said it was not Nefertiti, even though there was no name on it. Um, although we know that this is a, identified as Nefertiti, it's carved in the wall. So we know that this is Nefertiti because it's definitely identified as Nefertiti. I don't know who that is, but this is Nefertiti. Tutankhamun is very, uh, very well known because of, of his, uh, ri the riches that were found in his tomb. Uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, one of my teachers frequently calls him the, the insignificant Pharaoh with the significant funeral because of all the riches. Um, this is Pharaoh, Seti the first, 
of the 19th dynasty. Uh, he was the father of Ramses II, who was called Ramses the Great. This is the mother of Ramses, uh, the wife of Seti I. Um, her name was Tuya. And uh, I, this, this statue always fascinated me because I, uh, when I was a teenager, I dated a young lady who looked just like this. Um, Ramses II, called Ramses the Great. The Greeks call him Ozymandias uh, for some reason. Uh, Merneptah, the fourth pharaoh of the 19th dynasty, was the son of Ramses II. And I sat in the fret. Uh, he uh, defeat, defeated an invasion by the Libyans and conducted a campaign against ancient Israel. The 21st through the 24th dynasties had weak leaders that demonstrated social, economic, political disorganization. And a lot of them were uh, in existence at the same time. Then we come to the fourth golden age, um, the 25th dynasty, which lasted for more than 90 years. Arthur Weigel, an Egyptologist, called it that infernal inward dynasty. And it was a dynasty made up of Nubians that was based in what is now Sudan. Now, what's interesting is that they recognized that uh, throughout history, the pharaohs and people of Kemet were their kin folk, even though they did have their, their disagreements, uh, but they recognized that kinship and uh, they had a similar uh, religion, if you will. I hate the word religion, but that's the only word I can think of to describe it. Um, oh, and what they saw happening uh, after the 19th dynasty was that uh, Kemet was getting away from the ancestral uh, belief system. So they went to uh, restore uh, order into Kemet. Uh, and as a matter of fact, um, another name that Dr. Uh, Hilliard called it was the Restoration Age. The pharaohs were Kashtu, Pai, or uh, Pianki, Shabitku, Shabaka, Taharka, and Tantamani. Um, Taharka is mentioned in the Bible, in 2 Kings and Isaiah. He uh, defeated the Assyrians but was later defeated by the Assyrians and driven back to Nubia. The 26th dynasty was the last native dynasty before the Persian conquest. Uh, these pharaohs were Semeticus, Neko, and so on. And they were actually Assyrian puppets uh, who had conquered uh, Kemet after the 25th dynasty. Then after that, there were subsequent invasions um, that um, that uh, occurred uh, from the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Vandals, the Byzantine, the Arabs, the French, the British, and subsequently the Arabs. And I think it's very important to note that there are a lot of West African countries and some East African uh, ethnic groups uh, West African ethnic groups and East African ethnic groups that claim that their ancestors migrated to their current location from the Nile Valley. Um, I am compiling uh, some information on that. Um, so let's look at the uh, chemist's contributions to the world. Architecture, we know about the Horem market, we know uh, Tekken, Mortuary Temple of Hatshepsut that I mentioned, and some other temples. So let's look at those. Horem Aket, or the Sphinx. Horem Aket means Horus of the Eastern Horizon. Faces from east to west on the Giza Plateau. You can, at the, the lower picture, you can see the Great Pyramid in the distance. Um, it was originally believed to be a portrait statue of Khafre uh, of the Fourth Dynasty, but we now know that this is much older than Khafre. Um, there are some estimates that uh, suggested it uh, is about 10,000 years old. 
Um, so uh, that remains to be proven. The face is said to have been destroyed by Napoleon's cannon, even though several people who I respect greatly say this is not the case. Um, uh, Napoleon, when 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 they went in, they uh, he took scientists, and one of them, uh, Baron Denon, was an artist and drew a picture uh, of Horamaki. And apparently, uh, it's said that the nose and the lips are in the British Museum. Uh, they won't return them to Egypt. Uh, Tekken are also called obelisks of uh, tapered four-sided pillars with pyramids at the top. Of the hundreds of Tekken who built, only nine remain. They were taken by invaders and destroyed. So that uh, we have some Tekken in New York, we have Tekken in uh, Paris, we have Tekken in Berlin. Um, and they are religious monuments that are frequently called phallic symbols, but they actually glorify and honor the female principle. Um, that's a whole lecture in itself on, um, on, on how that so-called phallic symbol uh, does glorify and honor females. Uh, the George Washington Monument is an imitation of the Tekkenu. Um, and uh, the George Washington Monument was made of 36,000 blocks of granite that were faced with marble, as opposed to the comedic Tekken, which were made from a single piece of granite. Um, they were such perfectionists, there's a place that if you go to Egypt, they will show you called the Unfinished Tekken. Tekken. And you can see they were building it and it developed a crack in it and they abandoned the project. I mentioned the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut that was carved from the side of a mountain. And this is it. Um, looks very much like um, many uh, Greek structures. The temples of Waset or uh, Luxor and Epet Isut or Karnak were complexes that were multipurpose. And they were not only temples, but they were universities, they were hospitals, they were medical schools and astronomical observatories. And these buildings are huge. I can't, I can't describe just how surprisingly huge they are. Uh, they're still standing. And they are so big because seceding pharaohs would add wings to, uh, to these. The floor plan was essentially the same. In fact, um, the cathedrals in Europe, especially in Notre Dame and others in Paris and Spain, have actually the same floor plan. Uh, the styles used in construction were copied by the Greeks and today are called by Greek names such as Doric column, Corinthian columns, Ionian, but we have to consider what came first. Um, now, when the Greeks con conquered Kemet in 332 B B BCE, a lot of the buildings and statues were old and in disrepair. So the Greeks actually rebuilt a lot of the statues and gave them uh, Greek facial feature features. Um, this is the entrance to Epet Isut. These are some of the columns at Epet Isut. These are some of the Tekken. This was fascinating me. This is called the White Chapel, which was built in uh, by Sin Musret of the uh, 12th dynasty. It's, it's actually made of limestone uh, and it's very striking. Um, I tried to take pictures of some of the carvings in the, in the, in the walls, but they really didn't turn out well. Um, this is the reflecting pool with the Tekken in the background. Does that look familiar? Those of you who've been to Washington, D.C. may recognize this. Again, this is the original.
There's an avenue of sphinxes at the entrance to Ipet Isut. And this is the entrance to Waset, uh, base of the Tekken. These are some columns. And the architect and temple builder who designed and built much of Ipet Isut was a guy by the name of Amenhotep, who was the son of Hapu. He was uh, said to have come from extremely impoverished beginnings, but uh, was the, his, his brilliance was recognized and uh, he was given the opportunity to advance. This is a temple that was built by the Greeks in imitating uh, Kemetic culture. This is a temple of Physis at the island of Philae. The temple of Edfu, this was also rebuilt by the Greeks. This is the side of Edfu. Abu Simbel is a magnificent place. Uh, in order to get there, you, you're on a boat and you get off the boat and you have to walk up a little hill around a corner. And when you get to the top, this magnificent uh, edifice uh, is, is, is there. This was built by Ramses II of the 19th dynasty, um, carved out of the side of a mountain, and it was actually moved after the completion of the Aswan Dam, or it would have been flooded in Lake Nasa. Now we're gonna talk about Kemet's Kim contributions to the world. Now, Africans are often described as an oral people, which is true, but it suggests that we didn't write. However, when writing was first used in Europe, Written history had been kept in Kemet for thousands of years, and there were three kinds of writing. There were the metanature or the hieroglyphs. Uh, metanature means divine speech, and it was formal used in situations and, um, and, and, and probably had some elements of spoken language. Hieratic was an everyday cursive script, and demotic was the common, common language. In education, the educational system in Kemet was called the mystery system um, because advanced technical ideas and skills were only taught after a rigorous program of study. And uh, it was written in oral system open to everybody regardless of heredity, sex, or socioeconomic status. The complete course of study was 42 years. Now, some people say it was less, um, I, uh, but uh, the complete course of study was 42 years. For thousands of years, even after the Greeks uh, got there, they were not allowed to be educated. But when they were finally allowed to matriculate, they were actually the first affirmative action students, uh, as, as said by one of my teachers, uh, Wade Nobles. But none of them completed the 42-year course, so they also may have been the first dropouts. The longest lasting Greek student in Kemet was said to be Pythagoras, who is said to have studied there for around 24 years before he started his own school. And they, uh, the curriculum had several liberal arts, uh, grammar, arithmetic, rhetoric, dialectic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Uh, this is something that's uh, particularly interesting to me. Uh, we talked about uh, Imhotep. Now, comedic medicine was very specialized. Herodotus talked about it. And uh, their specialization was not unlike today. Uh, physicians had titles such as guardians of the anus. And because of uh, this specialization, the comedic people were very healthy. In fact, Herodotus called them the healthiest of all men. Hesi Ra was another physician who lived around the time of Imhotep. And there are some people who say that he was actually uh, predated Imhotep, although I've not been able to find that. But his specialty was diseases of the teeth and gums. So in essence, he was the, the, the first known dentist. Uh, comedic medicine was socialized. All people had access to medical care, regardless of their economics circumstances. There are many female physicians. It was non-sexist. Uh, Sanu is the, was the comedic term for physicians. 
and there were no barriers to women becoming whatever they wanted to do. Uh, the first known female physician was Lady Pesachet of the fourth dynasty. And her title was Lady Overseer of the Lady Physicians, uh, which obviously indicates there were other female physicians. Um, there were high standards of comedic medicine. Uh, patients and families could stimulate investigations into physician performances. And if the physician was proven negligible, they could be punished. The other types of physicians were surgeons. Uh, most, most of these were priests of the lion-headed nature segment. Now, nature is an aspect of God. Some, uh, some of the ignorant um, scholars have called them gods, but they were aspects of the one great God who uh, were very symbolic in, 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 in their appearance. Uh, Segment presided over war as well as healing. So her priests provided care to those entered on the battlefield. And these priests are considered by some to be the first organized medical uh, association. This is Segment, had the head of a lion, body of a female. Um, most popular and respected during the first 10 dynasties and was part of the original trinity that include her husband, Ptah, uh, on this rock, I build my church, Ptah, uh, and uh, Nephitim, their son. Then there were orthopedists that took care of broken bones. Interesting, they, not, they weren't considered to be physicians, but were considered to be artists. And then there were obstetricians who were considered to be midwives, and, uh, but they delivered babies. There were comedic medical textbooks, and they were usually rolls of uh, papyrus with pages approximately 40 centimeters long, 32 centimeters wide, uh, written in heretic. And they gave titles detail about quantity and instructions for drug intake, and everything else was written in black. We'll talk about some. Edwin Smith uh, papyrus, named after the man who discovered it or stole it. Uh, believed to be written almost 5,000 years ago. It's more than 15 feet long. Um, and uh, if, uh, I do a lecture on um, our African origin of medicine. And if you all like, I will try to do that one. And I go into a little more detail. The Ebers papyrus, the Cahoon papyrus, uh, the Chester Beatty, Hearst, London. Some of these were actually uh, practical handbooks similar to what we call cliff notes. Um, and these are all medical uh, textbooks. Now, how could Hippocrates be called the father of medicine when we know about Imhotep, Pesachet, Hesse Ra, and all these medical textbooks? who lived thousands of years before Hippocrates. Things that make you go, hmm. Discoveries of Pythagoras are documented on comedic papyri hundreds of years before Pythagoras was born. There are two basic uh, mathematical papyri, just like there are medical textbooks. There's the Berlin papyrus and the Rhine papyrus, which contain algebra fractions, geometry, and uh, they, they um, describe pi. The original Trinity, uh, I mentioned Pata uh, segment and that's done, but then the, uh, the most recent Trinity was Asar, who the Greeks call Osiris, Aset or Isis, a Heru or Horus. The original Madonna and Child were Isis and Horus, or Aset and Heru. I can give a whole lecture on this judgment scene here, too. Um, in fact, I have given whole lectures on just this um, 
uh, copyright. The term pantheon has been inaccurate. And I, uh, I want to reiterate, they were not polytheistic animal worshipers in the Western sense. They believed in one great God who was present in everything and had many aspects. And this belief system uh, left with them and, and is, is, is uh, held in, in West Africa as well as East Africa and Southern Africa to this day. Um, other contributions to the world, astronomy, creation of the calendar, architecture, ethics, the calendar. They, uh, the Kemetic people had a calendar that had 12 months. Uh, each month had three weeks of 10 days. And then they had five days that they used as holy days, uh, holidays. Uh, mineralog mineralogy, shipbuilding, there's evidence given by uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema that people from the 25th dynasty sailed to uh, Mexico and the uh, giant heads uh, that are found among, that are Olmec heads uh, are dressed in dress that was typical for 25th dynasty soldiers. Um, uh, religious values, again, uh, this, this is one of the heads that are found in Mexico that uh, so-called experts say these are not black people. This is not a black man. Um, they were, the Olmecs were the first known American civilization. Uh, and this, uh, there's evidence of African presence in Mexico that goes back to 800 BCE. That's 2,000 years before Columbus got lost. So again, Arnold Toynbee, it would be seen that when we classify mankind by color, the only primary race that has not made a creative contribution to any civilization is the Black race. Again, these are some uh, excellent startup reading that I, uh, that I would uh, highly suggest. So back to the question, was Cleopatra black? Thank you very much. And uh, questions, comments, criticisms, challenges? I'll break the ice, Dr. Gallman. The Omec, that last slide you talked about being the first civilization in, in, uh, this, on this side of the ocean, uh -huh. um, did, was that a precursor? Was that civilization a precursor to the ones we know of as the Aztecs, or the Mayas, or the Incas? I think so. I think so. Uh, it is is commonly accepted as being the very first civilization. So I would imagine, I don't know that there are any direct ties to the Aztec Incas, uh, but, um, but it is the first. Well, that, and, that, uh, I've, I've, I've been to the top of some of the, the pyramids in Central America. Okay. They are kind of spookily like, I mean, they don't look just alike, but the concept of, of building a pyramid for some kind of ritual purpose uh, was um, 1,000, 1,500 years uh, ago in Central America. Mm -hmm. And actually, most of the 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 the, the pyramids in, in in Mexico and Central America are what they call ziggurats or step pyramids, and um, that they are similar to the one that Emotep built at um, Saqqara, although they are much smaller. Questions? Can we revisit? The, I'm from I'm from Washington D.C., and so the idea of the inflection pool and in the monument was very interesting to me. So can we revisit that again so I can take a couple of notes on how that was assimilated to the way that the monument is now? Sure. 
Actually, um, are you familiar with Anthony Browder? No. Um, Anthony Browder does a tour in DC and has actually written a book entitled Egypt on the Nile, oh, Egypt, uh, Egypt on the Potomac. Oh, okay. Egypt on the Potomac. And, and uh, on his tour, he not only talks about the, um, the, the reflecting pool and the, and the uh, Washington Monument, but he show, goes through government buildings and shows retentions of uh, imitations of, of ancient Egypt. And I think it's very important. I'm not a Mason, but I think it's important to mention that the, uh, many of the so-called founding fathers of America were Masons. Right, right. And uh, Egyptian... Um, figures and, 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 and uh, well, Egyptology figures heavy in, um, in, 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 uh, masonry. In, in, in masonry. And one of the, uh, it's interesting because uh, years ago, I used to be asked to lecture to masons quite a bit. And I didn't understand why not being a mason but I was teaching them, <laughs> apparently I was teaching them something that, that they wanted to know. But um, uh, that uh, Egypt on the Potomac is a little book um, and it has a lot of pictures. I recommend it very, very, very highly by Anthony Browder. Um, and uh, if you're back home in DC, um, if you ever go and let me know I, I, what I can do is put you in touch with him. Um, and they can, they schedule it. Um, they don't just do it every day, but they schedule it and uh, find out when the next schedule um, turn, uh, tour will be. Okay. It, it's certainly worth, it's certainly worthwhile. I mean, they go to the Library of Congress. They go to a lot of different churches. They go to all, 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 all different places. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I, I, one more thing, I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> um, so the answer to the question whether or not Cleopatra is black, and I guess it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty obvious. <laughs> well, well, what would you say? I would say yes. Okay. Um, now, you know, and I, and, 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 and I have to take some blame for this. Um, Cleopatra was, uh, came along at the very end of the history of Egypt. She actually, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, people have confused us with is they don't put things on a timeline. So you notice where I talked about all the invasions, mm -hmm. and the Greeks, uh, when the Greeks invaded, and I, I think I'll, uh, for, next, for next year, I'll put that in, uh, include that in the lecture. Um, when Alexander uh, invaded and conquered Egypt and the Greeks did all the repairs and the imitative uh, work, um, Cleopatra, and first of all, there were seven Cleopatras. The Cleopatra that we talk about is Cleopatra the seventh. Um, and um, I, I, I remember the argument between uh, two of the elders, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark and Dr. Joseph Ben Yakinen, about her. And one favored her, the other one didn't. The, the argument is a mood argument, really. Uh, my answer to that is it doesn't really matter whether she was black or white because everything had been done by the time she came around. No. All the, all the, the, inventions and the discoveries and the innovations had been completed. So it really doesn't matter whether she was black or white. What Dr. Clark used to say, we know that historically uh, she had a affair with Julius Caesar and with Mark Antony. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And uh, Dr. Dr. Ben used to say, you know, she was a, a less than virtuous woman and he didn't want to uh, give her any credit. What Dr. Clark said was that she was uh, dedicated to her people and she sacrificed herself for the betterment of Egypt. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, 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 inter it was, it's very interesting to, to, to listen to those two wise old men go back and forth. But um, my answer is it, it really doesn't matter whether you're uh, black or white because everything it, of, of worthwhile had been done thousands of years before she lived. Okay. It's interesting to know that there were seven of them. I didn't know that. I thought it was just only one. Yeah. Yeah, clear pack. She was clear patch of the seventh. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Alice. Alice is waving her hand. She doesn't. Miss Broadwater, well, I hear. I, I I see your lips moving, but I don't hear you. She, she did you put your question in the chat, Alice? The button at the bottom you can hit that says. Says chat. What's it say? What's it say? Miss Broadwater, the mute button is on facing you, and it's on the left-hand bottom corner. If you click on that, I'm a, she's unmuted. I would see if she was muted. Okay. We can anticipate that Alice is typing her question in the chat. <laughs> Recommended readings. Dr. Goldman, did you? Yes, sir. I was uh, um, Lake Carlton um, said he was going to be there in April, so I was putting in a contact for him. Uh, the IKG Cultural Resource Center in Washington is, is Tony Browder's organization, and uh, you can get them online, and uh, they will be more than happy to um, tell you when there will be a tour and, and, and make that uh, arrangement. Are there any other questions? If not, next week, we're gonna talk about um, West Africa. You know, we were, we're, we're dealing with thousands of years ago. Now we're gonna talk more recent what, who were the Africans that were being kidnapped uh, by the Europeans? Who were they? What were they doing? Um, were they indeed the ignorant savages that uh, the daughters of the Confederacy like to, to say were, who were fortunate to be kidnapped and civilized or were they something else? And uh, we're gonna talk about that uh on uh next sunday uh miss broadwater did you ever because i want to try to answer your question if i can well she she had wanted to uh recommend readings dr gallman and I, i'm going to email everybody that's <clears throat> that's here tonight this list that you have it's two pages long so it's be like rather laborious to put it up on the screen and wait for everyone to copy it uh, and so I'll just email it to everyone. Okay, okay. And uh, the the Browder book and the Van Sertema book are the ones that I recommend that you start with. Um, uh, especially the Browder book. Uh, Anthony Browder, uh, I think I may have mentioned this before, but he has made literally hundreds of trips to Egypt and has a relationship with the Egyptian government he is the first and only uh, African-American who has 
funded and conducted an archaeological dig, which is ongoing uh, in Egypt and is uh, discovering a lot of very, very new information, particularly about the 25th dynasty. And um, his book, Tony is extremely brilliant and has the ability that I admire of breaking down extremely complex topics into very easily understood uh, ways. So, uh, and Marjorie, I think you, you're happy to know he's a power grad. And uh, okay, and Ms. Miller too. Okay, he's a Howard grad. And um, uh, so his book, uh, Now Valid Contributions to Civilization, I recommend extremely highly. And then uh, uh, Van Sertema did three books on ancient Egypt. He did uh, Now Valid Civilizations, which actually was uh, uh, the 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 what, uh, what do you call it when you type out a lecture um it was a conference called the Nile Valley Conference held at Morehouse College uh back in the 1970s and uh Nile Valley Civilizations by Van Sertema and then he did um Egypt Revisited and he did another one Egypt Child of Africa and all three of those books and, and Van Sertema didn't write those books, he edited them, and he got experts in various fields to uh, comment on uh, ancient Egypt from the perspectives of their particular fields and of expertise. And um, Van Sertema actually is actually one of the people that I enjoy reading because he also edited a book, African Presence in Early Asia, African presence in early Egypt, I'm sorry, in early Europe, and African presence in early America. Um, and uh, one of the books that I use as reference is uh, his book, They Came Before Columbus. Um, a lot of people criticized it because he wrote it in a, in a, in a way that was not the stilted um, language of, of academia, but um, no one could argue with his findings or his documentations. Um, and uh, finally, uh, another book that I recommend extremely highly is a book by my good friend, Charles Finch, uh, Echoes of the Old Dark Land. He has six essays in there in that book that I think are pivotal to understanding a lot of different things. So, um, Dr. Dr. Goldman, Cecil Ruby has his hand up. Yes, sir. Can you hear you? Well, Okay, uh, you put your question in the chat. Okay. Stephen Colbert said the most three famous words of the pandemic are gonna be unmute yourself. <laughs> well, while we're waiting for Susan to type, um, we will place uh, the four page uh, syllabus that was recommended reading. It's a very lengthy list of books that Dr. Goldman uh, has submitted uh, of the class two study guide at the end of the class two study guide so oh. you can access it. No? No, no I was answering Cecil's question. Oh. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll no, put no, it up there rather than send it to just this this group because other people next week may want it. So we'll just let people know that there's an extensive list of recommended readings at the end of the class, class one. The yeah, class, those, end of class one study guide, which has already got some other stuff in it. And so Cecil's question, what was the question? Uh, were, were the pre, uh, previous pieces that, that I talked about trans, that were transcribed available on the internet? And no, they were published in a book called Nile Valley Civilizations. Now, that book was part of a journal 
And I'm not sure whether that journal is on, it's called the Journal of African Civilizations, I think, uh, that was edited by Van Sertema. So you might try Journal of African Civilizations to see if it's there. I don't think so, but it might be. Okay. Okay, this took a shorter time than I thought. Uh, the next class is this coming Sunday at four o'clock. Yes. And so we'll send that link out again. And um, we have a, a regular Monday night class tomorrow at 630 with um, uh, Dr. Hill Edwards, a uh, woman who has done incredible research about the, or the development of uh, basically a, a capitalist class society. Uh, in colonial South Carolina that was transferred from Barbados. It's a very interesting deep dive into that element of uh, the relationship between the enslaved and the, mer and the, the enslaved owners. So, Dr. Gomez, anything else to say here? Okay, to answer your last question, um, uh, Cecil, uh, UNESCO probably does because um, in the in in their seven volume um, series, the general history of Africa, that the Sheikh Anta Joe and Obinga were contributors to that. So um, they are the 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 books they call it an encyclopedia. The the general history of Africa is at that UNESCO uh, UNESCO site, uh, and that was a link in class one study guide. And yeah. the, the 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 encyclopedias themselves are downloadable. I mean, it's a lifetime worth of study. Yeah, I have 30, all seven. Took them thirty five years to put together, and there's three new editions out. They're book ten, eleven, and twelve now. Yeah, I used to whenever I went to Washington, they were on sale at the Museum of African uh, Museum of African Art, and. Uh, I, every time I went to Washington, I would buy one. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Marjorie. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Gallman, and thank everybody for coming. Tell your friends and neighbors about it, and we'll see you tomorrow evening at 6.30.